They're what? Jessica, no, no QR code today. No, you're good. I, I know who you are. You're here. <laughs> All right. Happy Friday, everyone. And I know the medical students have heard this spiel before, but for the new faces in the room, this is the Timothy A. Johnson Medical Scholar Seminar Series, where we invite key physician thought leaders who are actively practicing, but able to take what they're seeing in the clinic and apply it and use it to help guide their research. And I'm going to let Dr. O'Brien introduce our speaker today. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. O'Brien. Uh, I am a psychiatrist here at Carilion, uh, practice outpatient psychiatry, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Oslin today. He is um, the Chief of Behavioral Health Psychiatry Health at uh, the VA in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and also a professor at the Perlman School of Medicine at University of Pennsylvania, um, he, where he has been for 25 years, uh, did his fellowship in geriatric psychiatry there and stayed on from then on. But no stranger to Virginia, uh, he grew up in Richmond area and attended uh, William and Mary College and then went on to UVA Medical School. Dr. Oslin is an active practitioner and researcher in psychiatry and has many publications, um, numerous uh, um, involvements in book chapters, um, eight books that he's written, uh, 229 research publications, and is involved in many different um, editorial boards. He, in addition, um, I want to put some highlights in here that I thought were interesting. He was the received the Excellence Award at the Shark Tank Diffusion of Excellence um, for Virtual Integrated Health Hub at the VA system in 2020. Um, he had the HSRD Best Research Paper of the Year Award at the Veterans Department of Affairs Office of Research in 2022. Um, and on and on. Um, we are really thrilled to have you talk about these um, research findings that you have. And I got to listen to him talk about integrated care yesterday. So a wealth of knowledge. I encourage you all to please ask questions and listen carefully to this great speaker we have today. Thank you. Thanks, Virginia. And um, it's a great pleasure to be in Virginia uh, uh, again. Um, I go to, my mom still lives in Richmond, so I do make it to Richmond occasionally. So, um, but it's nice to come to the Southwest corner of the state and visit you guys. Um, a good friend of mine is the reason I'm here. Margaret, Margaret has been bugging me about coming down and, and visiting with you guys. So um, we can um, thank Margaret for pestering me enough to come. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, pharmacogenetics. I, I will, mostly focus on one big trial that we did in the VA, but talk about sort of the broad implications of uh, pharmacogenetics and clinical practice. So this will not be a talk about discovery genetics. So we're not going to talk about GWASs, and we're not going to talk about, like, how do we find the next best gene to test? Um, this was really a, a, a talk that's going to talk about the state of affairs like today, the tests that we know have some efficacy or some uh, implications to clinical practice? And are they useful in clinical practice today? And should we be using them more in clinical practice? Um, I, along with everybody else, hopes that we don't stop discovering genes that are, are helpful to us um, in clinical practice, but that's not gonna be the focus today. Um, so the focus today is on existing genes. So when we, as clinicians, decide about a treatment. There's a lot of things that go into our decisional hat uh, in terms of how we think about um, picking a particular treatment. Um, in the mental health field, we rely a lot on uh, sort of subjective items, mostly these things on the bottom. Um, past experience was, a, has the patient been exposed to that particular treatment? It could be a medicine, it could be a psychotherapy, it could be anything, something interventional, whatever. Um, is adherence, is this going to be somebody that's going to have a really hard time t tolerating or sticking to the treatment, et cetera, and all, all these 
cost does factor in, family history. These are things that we, um, in our head, are always thinking about when we're seeing a patient and thinking about, am I going to pick this treatment or that treatment? Uh, increasingly, we're trying to introduce more, um, what I would think of as somewhat more objective things into this decisional process. In the mental health field, none of this stuff is like standard of practice, I would say that would be absolute. But, um, you know, we, we do do some imaging to make sure that somebody doesn't have, an, you know, hasn't had a stroke and their depression is really stroke related and we need to focus on that. So there are places that some of these items fit. <clears throat> Pharmacogenetics is, is one of the items that are sort in, in this more exploratory, not standard of practice at this moment um, places. And um, hopefully I'll introduce it enough that you'll be intrigued to think about whether it's going to be a standard of practice for you down the road. Um, so I want to distinguish um, at the beginning um, a concept between precision uh, medicine and personalized medicine. So precision medicine for me really is that there's some objective marker, biomarker, or some test result for which it is influencing our decision to pick treatment A over treatment B. Personalized medicine is the idea that when you're treating a patient and they start to have a side effect, that particular patient, or they start to not have response, or they start to um, ha have um, some unique response, that you are adjusting treatment for that patient based on that individual's experience. So that's not a test or a biomarker. That's that's you know meeting the patient where they are and, and thinking about that. And, and both of these concepts are really, really important. Um, pharmacogenetics clearly fits in the precision medicine category in the sense that it's a a test result that will help influence you in terms of thinking about treatment choice. All right, the other big concept that I wanna talk about um, at, at the beginning of this is distinguishing disease genetics from pharmacogenetics and sort of where we are this day and age. So you guys have in college and now part of your, probably your MS1 and MS2 curriculum will get a fair amount of disease genetics. So this is the idea that um, this uh, disease, so either the, either the cancer itself has a genetic profile that will dictate treatment, or the patient has a vulnerability, a genetic vulnerability for a particular disease. So good examples here would be BRCA for um, breast cancer on the breast cancer side, um, Huntington's disease, uh, uh, Huntington's um, gene on the, on the disease side. Those are disease genetics. That's not pharmacogenetics. They obviously have important pieces to treatment and, and knowledge and taking care of patients, but they're not pharmacogenetics. Pharmacogenetics is about the medicine, about the treatment itself. So, um, and there's two concepts here. One is the concept of uh, the kinetics. So are there genes that influence the kinetics of that particular medicine? And to be honest, that's where 99% of the literature is right now. This is where the state of the, the, where we are uh, in the science right now is mostly about pharmacokinetics. And I'll show you that in a minute. Um, the holy grail is pharmacodynamics, which would be that this gene would say this person's going to respond better to this particular medicine or, or um, you know, this. So, so I spent six years, Margaret was on this project. Um, you know, we thought we had a pharmacodynamic test for naltrexone. Um, there's, a, there's a genetic marker uh, in the opiate um, receptor that uh, uh, changes function of the opiate receptor. And it looked like early on that if you carried that particular gene, that particular allele, um, that you would respond better to naltrexone clinically uh, if you had an alcohol use disorder. We subsequently did the randomized clinical trial and didn't find that effect, but that's an example of a pharmacodynamic effect. You have a risk allele that will predict response to treatment. That's what everybody would really like. I would love that too, but we don't have a lot of examples of that. So we, we're, we're stuck with the state of affairs being mostly pharmacokinetics. And this is sort of how that plays out. So most, I would say the vast majority of these genes are 
really centered around the cytochrome P450 system, not all of them, but, but many of them. Um, and they really predict different phenotypes um, for an individual. Um, so on, on the one end, um, you have patients that if they carry a particular, so let's say they, uh, the medicine is, is enzymatically um, metabolized by cytochrome 2D6, um, predominantly, I mean, it, usually it's not 100%, but, but predominantly uh, uh, metabolized by that, and they are an ultra-rapid metabolizer for 2D6, that patient will theoretically have a much lower um, plasma circulating concentration of that medicine, and therefore would probably not have as much therapeutic effect. On the flip side, a poor metabolizer would have the opposite and would have a much higher level of circulating um, um, medication and more likely be exposed to side effects from that medicine, as most side effects are dose-dependent. Um, there's a lot of theory and a basic science around this, particularly for these cytokine genes that, that I'm not going to go over today, that's really solid, that the, the evidence base is, is super solid. Um, what, what The reason we did the trial that I'm going to show you about, and the reason that this, um, there's skepticism in this area, is what's not known very well is how much of this is really clinically relevant. So am I talking about on the ultra-rapid metabolizer side that I need to do a 10% increase in the dose? So, or do I need to do a 500% increase in the dose? And that piece, that clinical translation, is the part that we've been missing for a while in terms of, of the evidence to know whether doing these tests is actually useful in terms of managing patients. Um, hopefully we'll talk about that. The other thing that is very important is that these genes, the cytochrome system is not unique to a disease, right? So this is pharmacokinetics, um, not pharmacodynamic. So these genes play a role in lots of different illnesses. I'm going to make a point about that at the end in terms of the way that some of the companies have marketed these uh, genetic tests. So hold on to that thought. All right. Um, so... Uh, why are we interested in this and why are we interested on the clinical side? It's because this is a multi-million dollar industry. There's dozens of companies that do this testing for patients that market to providers that come to your office and say, you know, test this patient, I'm gonna cure this disease. Um, lots of misconception about how, how that marketing and what's done. So we need to know as clinicians, if this stuff is real and useful to us and how do we use it in our practice? Um, and which test could, should we use kind of things. All right, so why depression? So why did we take depression as a use case? Um, we took depression as a use case for this project or this area um, for, for these reasons, but the biggest reason is that um, psychotropic medicines are one of the, as a class, are probably the most commonly prescribed medicines in the U.S. It's a, it's a huge... Uh, amount of money spent on mental health. It's also a lot of burden in terms of patients being on medicines that could either be toxic to them, cause side effects, or, or not being efficacious. So, um, But on the disease side of it, um, these medicines aren't universally effective. Um, patients often have to have multiple trials of the medicines. And we know that every with every trial, patients are much less likely to come back and stay in treatment. They just get tired of coming and they, they stop coming and live with their illness, which is terrible. Um, and so there's a lot of reasons why if we could do better, if we could move the needle even 5% in terms of efficacy on a population basis, that, that would be a, a huge public health um, uh, advantage for us. So when we did the trial, well, this is actually current state as of the day, because it includes our trial. Um, th th while there was, there was vast um, basic science evidence that these cytochrome genes um, do influence metabolism and have an impact, there's really very little clinical evidence that in clinical practice, it makes difference. So when we started the trial, there was a handful of like pilot studies and you know 30 patient trials and that kind of thing. Um, the lar in, in, this, in 2017, there was a 685 patient um, trial, 
But these trials are all small, and they're small for the following reason. Uh, the way that these trials are done, including our trial, is that they're done at a population base. So the affected patients in these trials is about 20% of the population that was randomized. In other words, 80% of the patients in these trials are normal metabolizers or extensive metabolizers. And so the, the, there was no drug, there was no potential for a drug gene interaction. That means that effectively you can uh, do 20% of all those numbers and that's the effective size of the trial. So that 685 is really 120 patients uh, at best in terms of the size of the trial. Our trial at 2000 is really a trial of about 200 and some. Um, these are very expensive trials to do um, in, in this format. Um, and there's not really a way to pre-select a vulnerable population because you don't know their genotype until you genotype them. Um, and there's no predictions for that. So um, the interesting thing is all but one of these uh, showed a positive effect in terms of symptom reduction um, of depression. So the one that didn't is actually that 304 trial, which as you now know, was really only about 60 patients. So it's like a pilot study at best. Um, so a lot of growing evidence that these things make a difference. So how do we understand that? So this is one of them. This was the biggest trial before we did ours. So this was a multi-site trial. Um, I, I put this up here to show one, it was positive in the sense that people had, um, so the question, the way these trials are designed, to step back a second, is to ask the question, if a provider has this inf genetic information, does it, one, help them pick, um, pick medicines? Does it influence the decisional process in terms of the treatment? And two, does that decisional change make a difference in terms of outcomes? So here, what we're trying to do is say, okay, um, you're going to get treated for depression. I've done a test. This patient's a poor metabolizer for drug A and is a normal metabolizer for drug B. Um, if there were no other reasons not to pick drug B, you should pick drug B because now you don't have to worry about how you dose drug A. If you really wanted to try to dose drug A, you need to realize they're a poor metabolizer, so you probably need to start slower uh, and not go to a standard dose with it. But I don't really know what those doses are, right, because we don't have an evidence for that. So the easiest thing, pick drug B. That's how these studies were all designed, right? Um, and so this trial basically was 12 weeks. At the end of 12 weeks, a patient that had pharmacogenetically uh, influenced or um, decisional process uh, had better outcomes than the patients that were randomized to not have that PGX given to the doctor. So um, the way the trial works is I either get the test result back or I don't get the test result back. I treat the patient and we look at outcomes. And the genetically, um, pharmacogenetically, influenced um, side, the, the outcomes are better. And this trial did something really weird. I thought they actually didn't tell the patients. Um, so they blinded the patients. The assessments were double blind, but the patients were all blind. The, the treaters were not, so it wasn't triple blinded. The, the provider wasn't blinded because they had to make the decision about the medicine. They didn't tell the patient why they picked drug B over drug A. Um, I don't know that that really made a difference. And my guess is that the patients in that arm knew they were in that arm. So, you know, they had to think that the provider was making the recommendation based on the genetic test. So I'm not sure the blinding really made a difference. Um, this was their outcomes. And so this is sort of what you get. Um, for them, um, the symptom improvement was about an 11% improvement in the guided treatment as opposed to treatment as usual. Um, so you got 27% improved versus 24%, so 3%, not big differences. But remember, this is the entire population. So 80% of the people in here are noise. Um, so this is at the population level, you're getting a 3% change. Um, in terms of response, it's a little bit, it's 7% difference. And in terms of 50% uh, improvement, it's about a 5% difference. Those numbers you'll see in our in our study are almost exactly the same. We almost got exactly the same results, um, almost to the 100th decimal point. Um, is this enough to change your mind about doing testing? 
I think it depends on how you think about it. Um, you know, if I'm thinking about it as a healthcare system like the VA, that on any given day, 2 million patients are taking an antidepressant uh, that I'm prescribing an antidepressant to. If I could make 5% of 2 million people do better by a test that costs 200 bucks or so, um, that's a huge public health savings, right? Uh, it may not be great for the 95% of the people that didn't benefit, but from the 5% that really do benefit from a very cheap a test, um, it can be very helpful. All right, so then what did we do in the VA? So in the VA, we wanted to extend this literature a bit, um, but we took a little bit different approach. The prior trial was a very typical randomized clinical trial. There were um, a bunch of sites where there was a principal investigator that a principal investigator essentially saw, all, or, or their staff saw all the patients in the trial. Uh, so they were, they advertised for people in the community, they signed them up. And so a very typical uh, pharmacy, uh, pharmaceutical-like trial. We, we were very interested in um, going beyond that and not only asking the question if we, if providers um, change their prescribing behavior because of the testing, um, would there be positive outcomes? But we were also very interested in this, like, what would it take to, tra to train the workforce to use this test and, and to get providers to use it? Would actually frontline providers do this and use the testing? So in the, in the guided trial, um, you, could, you could guess that probably 100% of the time the investigator was invested in changing the medicine because they were invested in the study and they were getting paid by the study. In our trial, we went to frontline providers and, and signed up frontline providers to, to recruit their own patients. Um, and then we randomized those patients sort of at point of care. Um, and then the provider had to, would get the results or not get the results and then have to, to um, use those results. So we were very interested in two things here. One, one was, did the providers, how did the providers behave? And then two, did that provider behavior and the patient behavior actually make a difference in outcomes? I already told you the answer to the second. Um, so providers must have done something. Um, ours was over a six month trial. So we were interested in sort of longer term. We also knew that in regular practice, you know, it takes longer for people to write prescriptions and to come back for their appointments. And so the timing would be a little bit more delayed in our trial versus the other uh, trials. It's, it's more of a real world experience. Um, so inclusion, exclusion, so this was another difference, it was totally decided by the provider. So the provider, when they made a referral, attested to the fact that they were treating a patient for major depression, that they didn't have psychosis, they didn't have bipolar illness, they didn't have a substance use disorder. We didn't do a, like an eight hour long uh, intake that's typical in a clinical trial. We were trying to get point of randomization at the time that the, we wanted to make it really easy for the patient and the provider to get in. Um, so this was a, a very broad swath of patients um, that we were that we were getting out of practice. The only real inclusion criteria is they had to have a PHQ nine of greater than nine or ten or more. And we, uh, for more regulatory issues, we didn't want to have because we were trying to make this pragmatic and at point of care. We wouldn't have, we didn't want to have to deal with dementia, so we limited it to eighty. We didn't have we didn't want to have to artificially put in some kind of cognitive evaluation to make sure patients could consent. Basically, that was the decision for the eighty. That was that was in the entirety of it. So this is what the patients look like, and th this. Um, so we randomized um, nineteen hundred patients in the study. It was a big study uh, across the country. Twenty some sites recruited. Um, it was a pretty big undertaking. I had never done a study quite that big. I'd done multi-site studies, but never a 20-site study. So I had great staff helping, and a lot, of, a lot of people worked on this. But the population looks like VA population. So um, middle-aged, um, more, more um, men than women. But surprisingly, we actually, this is way more women than the VA takes care of. So the VA typically takes care of about 15 to 18% women. So not, not intentionally, but somehow we oversampled women, maybe because affective illness is a little bit more common in women. And 
the women that use the VA typically had more health problems than than the community. So they're typically uh, more ill and more likely to have depression. Um, other characteristics, we also recruited a fair number of um, minorities in the, in, in the study. We haven't done much with that. Um, and these were patients that do have um, social determinants of health that are not good for them in terms of not having a lot of money. This is clinically what they look like. So we thought we were going to actually recruit more mild to moderate disease. Um, but again, we didn't control recruitment. Remember that the recruitment is totally done by the providers. Um, so these tended to be uh, sicker patients. Um, so uh, PHQ scores of an average of 17 with a pretty broad range at, um, across the board. 30% were treatment refractory, meaning that they had had three or more clinical trials of an antidepressant or some type of treatment. It could have been ECT or TMS. Um, PTSD. So this is solely self-report. It plays out uh, in this and in, in, in the outcomes in a minute. Um, very, very common. So this was not diag... So again, we didn't do a diagnostic interview in the patient. So this was... They did a a PCL assessment, which is a self-report of PTSD symptoms. Um, so they had to acknowledge that they had, had an exposure to a trauma and then score high on their PCL. But half the sample, by using that criteria, had PTSD, um, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, you'll see in a few minutes. Uh, suicide ideation, 30% uh, of the sample had suicidal ideation. Um, not a lot of substance use because remember that was supposed to be an exclusion. So this is a good check that actually the providers did what we asked them to do. They didn't refer. We got a few patients that shouldn't have been in the sample, but um, by and large, this 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 paradigm worked, um, which is um, um, interesting in and of itself. But uh, I think on here, uh, sorry, sorry, it's hard to read up there. Um, um, maybe uh, not on this one, but um, cannabis was not an exclusion, and veterans use a lot of cannabis. We'll just leave it at that. All right. So, oh, that's the just highlighting the PTSD. All right. So we had two main hypotheses in this trial. What one was that um, that the clinicians would actually use the test, and we had no idea if they actually would or not. And so this was a real hypothesis, and we really wanted to try to understand why providers would or wouldn't. I'm not going to present a lot of the why they would or wouldn't today. Uh, that's other some other papers. But the first hypothesis was that they would actually use the test. It would change the way they practice. A, a little um, side note is that most providers have a limited um, um, portfolio of medicines they use. So like like none of the residents anymore know how to use MAMIs or TCAs or anything like that. Like, so I'm old, I still know how to use those medicines. So most providers have a very limited um, cadre. They get used to certain medicines and they use them over and over. They get very comfortable with them. So this is not an unimportant question. Could we use genetic testing to get them out of their comfort zone and prescribe something either that they had never used before or that isn't in their usual med complement. Um, so so that was the first question. So interesting. So the answer was yes. So what you see over on the right side of this is that, so these are um, patients that end up getting exposed to a medication for which they have a substantial drug gene interaction for, right? So they're a poor, basically they're a poor and ultra rapid metabolizer for that drug. Um, these are patients that there's some evidence, but it's not a high level, level of evidence that there's a drug gene interaction. So maybe they, they, they're they on a medicine that's predominantly 2D6 and they, they're a normal metabolizer for that, but they're, that medicine also has some 3A4 metabolism and they're a poor metabolizer for that. So that would be in this group. So that may, maybe there's a genetic thing here, but it's not a strong genetic thing. Maybe it makes a difference, maybe it's not. And then these are the folks that have, well, they're normal metabolizers, basically. And what you see in, in the uh, usual care is this would be the normal distribution if you're just prescribing without genetic information. So about 20% of patients by random are going to get started on 
of medicine and your regular practice every day when you're practicing, 20% of the time you're prescribing something that that patient has a substantial drug gene interaction for, and you don't know it typically. Um, and there's a bunch of people in the moderate and some in the not, not predicted. And if with, with the genetic testing, you get a, a huge shift into picking medicines that don't have any drug gene interaction. So that's, that's great. We, we can influence providers' prescribing behavior. Um, this is interesting over here. So what is this little graph? So the IRB was very, very concerned that we would delay treatment in introducing a test and we would keep people from getting a prescription. So they, they required us to monitor if people got prescriptions or not and how fast they got prescriptions. And what's fascinating is that um, patients in the guided treatment got prescriptions faster than patients in the control arm. Now remember in the control arm, patient says I have a patient, a provider says I have a patient today, I want to enroll them. Research assistant runs up to the office, consents that patient, they get randomized to usual care, the provider's told do whatever you're going to normally do, um, and they, they could prescribe anything they wanted to that day. Um, and still, they don't that day, often because, you know, the patients leave or the provider has moved on to the next patient or whatever. But we, we didn't see this effect that the testing actually delayed treatment at all, if anything, a little bit to the opposite. Patients were engaged when they had this test result. So may, maybe engagement may play a little bit of a role. All right, then the next question is, did this matter at all? Did, did, did shifting the prescribing behavior of the provider make any difference in outcomes? Um, so this was our main outcome hypothesis was that it would improve remission rates. It's a really tough bar to, to, um, to reach, particularly, again, we weren't thinking we were gonna have 30% treatment-resistant depression in the sample, so it's really a tough bar when you have treatment-resistant depression, but um, the, the punchline is there is a small 30% uh, odd, an odd ratio, 1.3 basically, a small but statistical improvement and remission rates in the guided treatment arm. Um, and that mostly plays out in, in the first you know 12 weeks or so, so in this domain. Um, people have made a lot of hay about that there's no effect at 24 weeks, um, we actually didn't design the study. This is an interesting issue. We didn't design the study to look at the individual time points. Uh, the study was designed to show this effect. And so that this one time point doesn't show an effect. I don't know what to make of that, to be honest. Um, this is the other two ways of looking at response. So this is response. Did they have a clinically significant decrease in their PHQ-9? Here you see an effect over all time points over the entire um, thing about the same effect size or HUDS ratio. And then this is just symptom improvement, the mean difference in, in scores over time. Same thing, all time points essentially pass the first time point, significant um, odds ratio about the same and same level of significance. So at a population level, we're seeing um, an improvement in depression outcomes across the population. Um, but again, I would suggest to you that, um, that this, this move is mostly uh, related to that 20% that we're shifting their medicines at, right? All right, so then we, so that's the main trial outcomes. That's the paper you guys read as MS1. So this is just some other interesting ways of looking at some of the data and some post hoc stuff. Um, I told you PTSD was half the sample. Well, we know Antidepressants aren't so great for PTSD. They're not our first line treatment. They tend to be the thing that people end up on, but they're not very effective. It's only two, maybe three of the medicines that are FDA approved for PTSD. Frontline treatment for PTSD is really psychotherapy. Um, and so we see that here. When we divided the group out and looked at, this is at 12 weeks, I think. Yeah, 12 weeks. We look at the patients. So these would be patients that are sort of treatment naive, more easier, straightforward patients. We actually get a much stronger effect in these patients. So this is an argument for testing people early. 
um, uh, it may be at the first time you're treating them. Uh, so a lot of the patients in this, these two groups were, this was their first treatment for depression. This is the treatment resistant depression only group, but they don't have PTSD. And, and again, we get a, a larger effect size and more effect in people that really have depression and can really respond to the antidepressant. And then when you get over here to the PTSD groups, you see a really diminishing effect of the pharmacogenetics. And that's because this is a pharmacokinetic test, not a pharmacodynamic test. So this test does not confer that you have depression and you're going to respond to an SSRI. So if you have a disease, it's not going to respond to an SSRI or an antidepressant, sorry. Um, the test isn't going to help you with the diagnosis, right? So that's, that's what this, is, this data is showing you. Um, so getting the diagnosis and getting the treatment still is important. So knowing that the person has depression and is going to respond to an antidepressant is still very, very important. But this is this provides a little bit stronger evidence that particularly in patients with uh, that you're really treating for depression and don't have comorbidities that the test can have value. Um, let's see. So oh, this is so it, let, let's say we just took off the randomization off of uh, off of the effect and and asked what the response rate is in patients that got exposed regardless of randomization. Uh, so this is very post hoc. But uh, so these are the patients that didn't get started, never got started on the medicine. That was actually a fair number of them. They sort of dropped out of care. Um, so the folks that get on either an, a no, uh, no drug gene interaction or one of those modest drug gene interactions have pretty good effect sizes. And regardless of randomization, if you get started on something that has a substantial drug gene interaction, you have a very low chance of responding to. And then one other... This is just right, right hot off the press because we just did this and I have a, a medical student exactly writing this up. Um, so, um, oh, that's the same thing. This is what I wanted to show you. So this, this was, um, so there are about 70 patients in the study on the intervention arm that got started on a med that was, had, had a drug gene interaction. We were very interested. Why did they do this? Uh, why did the provider end up choosing that medicine? So I had a student chart review every one of those 70 patients, and we categorized them into three, three different buckets. And the three different buckets were that um, we actually couldn't find evidence in the chart that the provider ever looked at the test result. Um, so there, it was never mentioned. There was no discussion in the progress note. So it probably never got used. I mean, we don't, we don't know that for sure, but there was no documentation of using the test result. Uh, on the flip side, um, so we paid attention to the very first prescription that happened after randomization as a matter of course. That's the way we wrote the analysis plan. The flip side of that was that 24 of the 70 patients were really a transition. So they did a renewal of a medicine that happened to be um, uh, uh, have a drug gene interaction, but they were really waiting for a non-formulary request to happen or for the patient to fill something that eventually was something that didn't. So they were transitioning. They would have been, they could have been tapering it. So they were coming off of their bupropion and going on to uh, uh, venlafaxine or something. So in, in essence, they were using the test results to change their prescribing, but the very first prescription still was something that uh, wasn't. Um, and they actually had really good outcomes. They ended up transitioning to a med with no drug gene interaction. The middle group is really interesting because the middle group is mostly psychiatrists that thought they could take the test results and interpret them. So there's, there's justification. I'm going to pick bupropion, even though it, it is a, that person's a poor metabolizer and I know I've got to dose differently. Um, and so there's all this rationale in their note about it. Um, and yet it's still, this is, this, these three groups are actually significantly different from each other. They, they couldn't do it right. And so what I would suggest to you is like where we are in 2024 is just, just pick another medicine. <laughs> don't try to be, don't overthink this pharmacokinetic thing. Ju just move on. And, and even if that medicine was your favorite medicine, um, don't, don't stick with it. All right. So this is just a big summary of our trial. So this was a VA-funded trial, so it was not industry-sponsored. Um, 
uh, comparing usual care to PGX guided care. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time, but education was, we spent, uh, unbeknownst to us, we, we had to really pivot early on and uh, spend a lot of time developing educational materials and stuff for the providers, both primary care and mental health, because they didn't have a lot of that. They didn't have a lot of knowledge about these tests. Um, and we found on a population basis, there was, there was an effect. But um, another really important factor that was part of the learning process is most of the providers going into this thought that this test result would help them with every single patient. And, and what, what's really evident, what I want you guys to realize is that's not true. It's informative in every patient because it will tell you that somebody is a normal metabolizer and you should feel good about dosing whatever you're dosing um, without worrying about the pharmacokinetics. But it's not going to tell you to pick something differently in 80% of the people because they're a normal metabolizer. That's not going to be the linchpin for that particular patient. And really, the test results are in themselves and mostly informative in about 20% of the patients where it may get you to prescribe differently. And so that was really surprising to most providers because the way providers adopt things is they try it a few times. And so in this case, if you tried it two or three times, and we saw this in the study, um, if you get test results that were unhelpful to you, in other words, the patient's a normal metabolizer, um, you actually don't order the test anymore. So you give up on it very quickly. And so that, that's a, that was a learning lesson for us and something that we had to really think about in terms of the educational materials and adoption. All right, I want to spend a couple minutes come on, on like which test real quick. So one of the things that happened in this trial is we picked a company. We decided not to do our genetic testing in-house because it was a little bit complicated at the time uh, to be CLIA approved. Um, and so we picked a, a, a we did, it wasn't random, but we picked one of the commercial products that was out there. That particular company um, sells a psychiatric panel of tests. Um, um, what that really means is they picked a set of genes that mostly uh, informed the decision around antidepressants, antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, that, those classes. And they don't include something on there for, say, um, Coumadin. So they don't include the gene for Coumadin on their test panel. Um, and what you get is that all these companies sort of market sort of different panels of genes. So um, you can see here, like this company has four, that these are the genes that are mostly relevant to psych psychotropics. And so this company has four of those, but then eight others. This company has seven of those or whatever, the, the one, uh, one, X minus one, I can't count that quickly. This one has, you know, thir close to 30. This one has almost 40. This one has almost 40. The price is different for all of these. Um, so how the heck do you choose which of these tests to do and which company to pick? Um, I don't have a great answer for you for that. I will say that there's some red flags here. Um, so without saying anything about any particular company, um, some of these companies, a lot of them have gotten out of the business that I will sell you a renal panel or a psychiatric panel or a cardiovascular panel. And the reason they've gotten out of that is they're increasingly, there's pressure on the companies and the FDA is trying to get into this to regulate it a bit, is that, that, that there's a little bit of a therapeutic misconception to that. So early on, I, I had said that, that basically these are mostly cytochrome genes, right? They don't just apply to psychotropics or just apply to cardiovascular disease. So if I market as a company a psychiatric panel and only give you interpretation for psychiatric drugs, and then that person, let's say they're a poor metabolizer of 2C19, and they go off and have a STEMI and get started on clopidogrel, and, um, and that 2C19 poor metabolizer was known um, by the patient. So am I liable now that they have a bleed after their STEMI because they didn't actually get anticoagulated? Um, it's a big issue. If the company only told me about psychotropics and didn't tell me that this person's a poor metabolizer for clopidogrel, is the company vulnerable or is the provider vulnerable? Um, so 
I, I would say I, I think it does a disservice to the patient. I don't, I don't know what test you guys use here locally, but um, to order these disease specific tests, because I think they, they really do give a misconception to the patient that they, the, the genes only, the gene results only apply to those meds. But it's sort of the Wild West right now. This is totally unregulated space. And if you really want to think about, so hospital systems are more and more trying to be more thoughtful about this and picking one company and or picking, um, you know, more selection. This was just to make that point. So, you know, if I did that eight panel um, cytochrome panel, these are all the different medicines that would be affected. So if I, res if I gave you results back only for the psychotropics on this list, I'm missing all these other opportunities to, to be informative to that patient. Um, and so this is just an example of how that plays out um, in, in, in reality. This is a, an interesting area for providers too, and some of the anxiety about getting testing because I'm the psychiatrist and I'm interested in um, you know, atomoxetine or something um, for that patient, but the patient comes back and they, you know, they they have they're on one of these other medicines that I'm not prescribing. So it's my responsibility to let that other provider know about that test result. Uh, that that is a dilemma that's in the field right now, or is it the patient's responsibility? And I just wanted to back up way back and just show you another, like where, where does the evidence actually come? So this is an example and then tie it back to clinical. So this is uh, tramadol and codeine. So this is opiate metabolism, uh, which is mostly, uh, which is predominantly metabolized by cytochrome 2D6. So this is what the basic science literature would show. So this is not from, these are from patients, but from normal controls, looking at um, actual serum levels of coding um, post, post ingestion. Now you have to remember that tramadol and coding are pre-drugs, right? So you guys know that from your pharmacology, maybe you haven't had pharmacology yet. Um, so what that means is that an ultra rapid metabolizer for tramadol or coding is gonna lead to what? A higher or lower level of drug? A higher, thank you, somebody got it right. It's a prodrug. So if I'm metabolizing it more, I'm going to end up with more analgesic effect. And if, because it's a prodrug, if I'm a poor metabolizer, I'm not going to end up with any, any analgesic effect. So, and that's shown in, in these bar graphs. Uh, here's, here's the rapid metabolizers. Here's the poor metabolizer. It actually pans out in serum levels in normal controls. And in fact, a poor metabolizer of tramadol codeine essentially has no analgesia whatsoever. Um, in their system. You can see very quickly why that patient could be escalated on dose. So do we have any evidence that this plays out in practice? Well, we, we don't have much. Um, we did a real, this is very pilot uh, data. We recently did this and I submitted it, we just submitted it for a grant. And we looked in the VA system where we knew people, um, we knew they had been genetically tested for something. It probably wasn't related to tramadol or coding. Um, and so we knew their genetic, we knew that they were 2D6 ultra rapid metabolizers. So we were looking at folks in this, in this group, not for analgesic effects, but really were there side effects to these. And we were able to show, at least preliminarily, that folks that are ultra rapid metabolizers that end up with more analgesia actually have a much higher rate of ER visits in the month that they get that prescription. So that's just a proxy for a side effect. Uh, essentially, that there's something happening, there may be something happening there that they end up with um, more, more negative outcomes. And then this was the other paper that you guys read, I think, as part of this exercise. So this was the PREPARE study that was done in Europe. There was a little bit different design here in the sense that these were patients that were being started on a medicine that had the potential for drug gene interaction. So the patients that were recruited were patients that were getting started on a medicine that has a known uh, drug gene interaction. The patients were recruited, uh, genotyped sort of right away, and then randomly assigned to giving that genotype information back to the provider. So the prescription's already been written, right? So the clopidogrel's already been written. The escitalopram's already been written. So then it's up to the provider to decide if they're going to do anything different to treat that cha patient, change the drug, whatever. 
And their outcomes was, was really a mix of, and interestingly, they saw about the same. So we saw about 20%. They saw about 25% of this probably a little bit more enriched population ended up having an actionable genotype. So about 25% of the patients that had been started on one of these meds had something that would suggest that this, that medicine should be used differently. Um, they had a different way of thinking about outcomes. Basically, they looked at two different sort of cohorts, and so you don't have to pay attention. This was sort of more of a validation. Um, but their idea here was, was there less, less events that happened? So events here could be side effects, drop, drop or of medication non-adherence or lack of efficacy, sort of a composite of negative outcomes. And essentially what you see is less negative outcomes in the pharmacogenetically um, guided group. So uh, not necessarily more efficacy, but less negative outcomes of which efficacy was one of them, lack of efficacy was one of them. So this is just a, another, this is another monster study to do 7,000 patients randomized. This was done by like county or by country. There are several countries that participated. In. So just next steps. So this is the, the part where I'll say, what, what do I do? And that's, some of the students heard this earlier. Um, so the upshot for me is this test is cheap. Um, even at $1,000, you're talking about a once in a lifetime test. That's less than an MRI. It, it's nothing in terms of healthcare costs. And it, and it lasts, if you amortize that over somebody's lifetime, it's really pennies. So the, the test itself is really inexpensive. The only harms that come from testing from people are um, misuse of the information, misinterpretation of the information. So if the provider really knows how to understand the test results, there's, there's not that much harm that can come from the test. You're not gonna get bad information from it, so to speak. So it's really knowing what the test results mean for you. Um, and, and the yield is um, good in some people, right? So in the patients that it would have changed your prescribing behavior, it's really, it's really helpful. It's not helpful in every patient. And so as long as you know that, you, so I, I offer the test to everybody. Um, with, with that kind of thought about it, realizing it's not gonna help every patient, but it may give that patient comfort in knowing that they don't have you know, a gene that metabolizes any of these medicines differently. And that's gonna happen in the majority of the patients. So where I'm at with this, this isn't the test that I really want. This isn't the test that tells me to pick this drug over that drug. It tells me to avoid this drug because I don't know how to actually dose this drug. Um, and therefore I should pick another drug, but it doesn't tell me which drug to pick. Uh, so that would be the holy grail down the road is having more pharmacodynamic genes. But currently these are helpful to me in terms of practicing, if nothing else, to get me to prescribe things that I feel more confident about the dose that I'm prescribed. So with that, I think um, this, the study that we did was huge, uh, a monster study to do. Um, Lots of people to thank to do that, but the veterans and themselves and the, and the providers were really the cornerstone of that study being a success. But, so thank you guys. Thank, do we have a couple minutes for questions? Or? Yeah. Um, I'm not a clinician, so can you give me an idea of how many of the drugs actually have these gene interactions? Like how many drugs? You could potentially That's a great treat? question. Um, so lots of medicines are metabolized by the, by the cytochrome system. The, the way that we think about this currently is that we, um, there's a nonprofit organization that sort of looks at all the basic science literature and the literature we have for each individual medicine. And that group comes up with sort of a rating, A, a B, and C. And the A level are the ones that, that essentially, if you look, it's sort of a consensus way of thinking about things. But um, the A level 
medicines are the ones that we feel pretty confident that we should probably be testing for and the results would indicate a change. So if you looked at just the A-level medicines, there's probably about 40 or 50 very commonly used medicines that would fit into that category. The B-level, where I would say they're not B because the evidence, they're mostly B because we don't have a lot of evidence. And so uh, as time goes on, my guess is more of those B-level uh, meds will move to A-level as we get, get garner more information. And so that's a much bigger group of medicines. But e even with that, so the chance of getting exposed to one of these 30 or so medicines in your lifetimes is about 100%. So, as, so we did some simulation. There's a paper that I was on, if you're interested, where we simulated. We took the VA population and took all of the prescribing that every patient had, and we modeled what the chance of getting exposed to one of those 30 medicines basically was 100%. So in your lifetime, even with this select group of, uh, of, of medicines, the chances are pretty high that you, could, you, that you will get exposed to a medicine that has the potential for drug gene interaction. It doesn't say that you have that gene, but that you can be exposed to one of those. Okay, and then I had another question about sure. the, the doctor's behaviors. Have you thought about a similar paradigm where you actually ask the provider to first make a recommendation agnostic of the test result and then make a recommendation or a prescription? So we actually have that data. We okay. did. So when they made the referral, we asked them, and we actually haven't looked at this yet. Um, we asked them which medicine they were intending to prescribe. I haven't, we actually haven't looked at the data to see how discordant that was in the intervention group. Um, and just, we just haven't looked at it. So we did, we actually asked that. Yeah, um, I think that would be very interesting. Could be a good student project. <laughs> Dr. Oslin, I have a couple of questions too. I think one of them is kind of on the heels of this. You know, you said uh, many providers, it hasn't, the uptake hasn't been great yeah. in the clinic, clinical world. And I'm wondering, you said, you know, a lot of people get um, turned off because they have it not work for every patient. Right. Why doesn't it work for every patient? Do you well, think? Is that because of other receptors and side effects there or? Well, mostly it's, it's sort of, it's um, uninformative is probably not, I need to find a different word. It's informative if, you, if you're not a carrier of a gene that, that makes you a rapid or poor metabolizer, right? So that's information, um, but it doesn't change your prescribing for that. It does, it's not informative in the sense that it was in that first slide in the decisional process. So it becomes not part of the decision anymore because they're a normal metabolizer. Um, I think people... So what we learned early in doing this trial is that the field really hasn't learned about pharmacogenetics and testing, and they really weren't that informed. And so uh, there was a lot of belief at the beginning of the trial that these tests would, would pick the right medicine for them, uh, that this would come back and say, this person would be best on S-citalopram, and that's the medicine they're going to respond to. I, I didn't, so we didn't actually anticipate the degree to which providers were not knowledgeable about this in, the, in this trial. Um, and so we actually had to pivot very early to do a lot of time um, educating the providers. But one other thing I told the students at lunch, one other thing that was kind of fascinating with this is also some of the misbeliefs about pharmacogenetics. So um, to, get to, 12, to get to the 2,000 patients, we actually recruited 700 providers. And so what are, that means that some of the providers never referred anybody. So they, ha, they were a participant in the study too. They consented to be in the study. So we had providers that consented to be in the study with the intent. I don't know if they were just friends of the local investigator or what they were. But, but we did a post-survey of, of all the providers. And we got some, I think it was like 50 or 60 of those pro providers that did never referred anybody to, to the trial. And one of the questions to them is why? Why didn't they refer anybody? 100% of them answer, and this was, you never get 100% physicians answering anything, particularly 40 or 50. 100% of them thought that the, the test results were influenced by pharma. They, did, they, didn't, they didn't actually think that this was a biologic thing. Yeah, so that's some of the stuff. So that stuff has to get educated out of people, right? And so it seems like maybe that... Because when you're presenting this data, you know, it's it's applicable to so many medications, yeah. not just psychiatric ones. Yeah. So it could be beneficial 
for all of medicine. Yes. Um, and I haven't heard about, I don't know if anyone else has, I haven't heard about it being used in anywhere but psychiatry. That's not, not true. true. Okay, good. Uh, good. So, <laughs> because you think uh, about tacrolimus for transplant, you think yeah, about yeah. tamoxifen, 2D6 for yeah. oncology, you think about Absolutely. so many. So different healthcare systems. So part of, I, I think the bigger question here is really an informatics question, right? So, so currently the state of affairs is you have a provider-patient interaction for a test result. That individual provider is interested in a particular thing, right? And so the notion that that provider would order a test that's useful to, the, to that patient's entirety of their healthcare, is sort of a foreign concept for the way we practice, right? So that you would order a test that was helpful to the cardiologist is not something that's really, you'd never really thought about that, right? And that's what this test is in, in essence in terms of its global applicability. Um, so the way you get around that is that really this has to be a healthcare, a healthcare system decision. So where we've seen much broader uptake is in healthcare systems. So like if you go to the Mayo, you're, every new patient at the Mayo is offered pharmacogenetic testing, right? So that's a healthcare decision. That's not an individual provider decision. And then the other piece to that that's so important is the clinical decision support after that single test is done. Because if I do a test a day, and it's just me and the patient that knows about that test, and then that patient moves on, or I, I retire or whatever, and they get another provider five years ago, how does that new provider know about that test? So that's another healthcare system problem. Which was my third question about yeah. integration into the EMR. Yeah. Because these are all, or at least the ones I've seen, the ones we use are separate from, they're not in the medical record, yeah. they're separate. And so you get a report and that then never, it's not in the EMR yeah. for anyone to see. Um, so having it present there and some sort of flag that shows that a patient has it would be yeah. helpful. So this, I, so we, what I would say the last 10 years we've seen, a, you know, the explosion of these companies doing the testing and doing sort of this one-off transactional state. The, the next real explosion here is figuring out the MR piece. So, and, and that piece is also very important because the knowledge base is ever evolving. There's new medicines as, you know, we may find, a, a, you know, something different about 2D6 down the road or whatever. So as long as you've got the genotype, you, you can change the clinical decision support um, fairly readily in the EMR. And that, that, that's going to be the next, there's already a bunch of companies like leveraging for this space to be able to interface with Cerner and, or Oracle, whatever they are now, or Oracle and, um, and Epic and the, big, the bigger, bigger companies. So that, that informatics piece is huge. Um, and, and I'm sure Epic is working on it as well. But they don't have a good package right now for this either. So for the patients who did have the mutations that were relevant to drug gene interactions, um, what does knowing their genotype, how would that, I guess like, because we're seeing it from the population you had, yeah. but at the individual, the 20%, how would their clinical outcomes different? I guess like have I know it's obviously you didn't know all yeah. of their genotypes going in, but yeah. are you going to follow those patients forward to see if that? Well, no, because it costs a lot of money. But <laughs> um, I mean, so that's sort of the hint at the secondary analyses in the sense that so if if you got exposed to a red med sort of any time during the trial, your your chances of res response or remission were lower. Um, but those weren't. So this is a, an exercise in scientific integrity in some ways. I mean, what we published was was the hypothesis that we uh, designed the study for and um, were able to test with, with high integrity to the design of the study. I, I would love to do this as a NUC study, and I probably would design the study very differently knowing the knowledge we have now. But that's what science is about, right? So you do studies, you... You learn something, but you also, part of that learning is how to do the next study better. Um, so there's lots of ways that I would have done this better uh, and where we would we would probably, you know, so one, one way to do this would be to genotype people, genotype two or 3,000 people, but only randomize people that have high risk alleles, right? And so that's actually what we did in the naltrexone study we did before. We oversampled people, blindly oversampled for people 
that had had uh, the genes of interest, basically. So that would be an, a way of enriching your sample to say that this effect is more real, right? Yeah, it's a good 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 question. But you can do these post hoc things too. That we and we are publishing the post hoc analyses, so. but they're not as strong. Any other questions? I just wanted to let you all know, you probably know more now than most of your faculty. <laughs> um, and it won't be the first time. So planting the seed for you all, where do you want to see moving this forward? Because it is something that can help individuals and a population. So are we at the VA going to add 2D6 poor metabolism to the problem list? I don't know. So in the VA, we actually have point of care decision-making. So we, uh, for veterans, veterans can get tested for free if you're at the VA. Your VA does it. Um, it's a, the, the panel's from Stanford Health. Um, and it's a pretty broad panel. It's not focused just on psychotropics. And there's point of prescription, this clinical decision support. So when I go, even if I didn't or even if I didn't order the test, the, the genetic test, if I go and I write for Paxil, and that person or paroxetine, sorry, I'm not supposed to use genetic names. I go and write for paroxetine, and that person is a poor metabolizer for paroxetine. I'll get a little pop up that says. Hey, this is a poor metabolizer for broxidine. You might want to think about something different. Um, and so that's what's happening in the VA. That's where we need to be. Uh, the VA is ahead of the curve in many ways on this. Which is really great because veterans deserve the best care and don't get it. So I want to thank you for serving the veterans and all thank the work you. that you do and for helping us because some of you may be Nancy Agee someday in your healthcare systems. And I hope that you care about integrating information. How long have we known about 2D6 uh, poor metabolism? Since I was in medical school. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but now one health system nationally is doing that. Are there any other Mayo Clinic? But I don't know if it's in the data where they can use it effectively. And Mayo does, so yeah. There are, there are healthcare systems that have That's, figured this out, yeah. Could we be one of them? or wherever you go, try to go to the place where you train with the best information and the best informatics, because it does matter. The other thing you can do is people get these on their own. They sign up to yeah. get the genetics and you go with your documents to your provider every time. That's hard to do, but that's the best we can do right now is get people to get their tests and bring them to every provider because there's a lot of meds on there that could be changed. So you can at least do that. So one plug to the healthcare system, if you guys, if you guys wanted to promote testing, I, I actually, so this is the exercise we're going through at Penn right now, is the problem that you described where providers are ordering any of a couple dozen different tests for the healthcare system is there's no value in that right it's valuable for that patient so if you wanted to even make a dent in the informatics problem pick a company and promote that one company get a contract with them so that you're getting the, the actual raw genotype data back even if you can't use that raw genotype data today in four or five years you'll easily be able to use it as part of epic so it, you'll be a way ahead as a healthcare system to stop the individual transactional, and you'll stop the misconception of the cardiac panel and the renal panel and the, that, that kind of thing. You can pick a company that, that is more transparent about the effect of the genes across all medicines. Okay, before we thank our speaker, I wanna make a quick announcement before all the medical students leave. Because there's no exam this block, those questions about our speakers are going to be in a quiz form. It, oh, it gets sorry. released today. <laughs> Yay, but it's not too bad. Um, it, so it'll be Sunday the 15th that it'll be due. Okay. All right. Now we can thank our speaker. <laughs>